If you kept record of my sin And held against me what I've been How could I stand before you?
God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, fellow children of God. Sometimes it can be hard to say goodbye. Maybe it's a child who's going off to college or maybe going off to serve in the military. Or maybe it's some family members who we don't get to see very often, but they just came to celebrate Thanksgiving or Christmas and and now they have to go home. Maybe it's just a loved one who's going away on a journey. Or maybe it's on our child's wedding day. And, and when we say goodbye, there's often a sense of joy because you know maybe they're starting a new chapter in their life or, or maybe they're going on an exciting journey. But at the same time, there's always a sense of longing. Because even though we may see them often, we know it's not quite the same as it was before. Well, on this Sunday, on Saints' Trey, Alton Sunday, we're reminded that, yeah, sometimes we even have to say goodbye because our loved one who has gone before us, who has lived their faith, has now left this world behind. Our Lord in His grace has decided it's time to take them to their eternal home. And on the one hand, yeah, there's, there's a sense of longing, there's a sense of emptiness because things aren't going to be the same as they were before. We'll miss them. But at the same time, Scripture also gives us joy. As, as we read in the book of Revelation, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor for their deeds will follow them. We know that those who trust in the Lord have a new eternal life in heaven. And as our scripture reading for this morning reminds us, we also can have joy because we know that one day we get to go there too and we get to be reunited by the hand of the Lord. And that gives us a great deal of comfort because even though as we look around the world it's very clear that sin brings separation into the world, we also know that God's grace gathers us together before the Lord. We hear, we hear this comfort in the words of our Old Testament lesson, Ezekiel chapter 37. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, take a stick of wood and write on it, belonging to Judah and the Israelites associated with him. Then take another stick of wood and write on it, Ephraim stick, belonging to Joseph and all the house of Israel associated with him. Join them together into one stick so that they will become one in your hand. And when your countrymen ask you, won't you tell us what you mean by this? Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am going to take the stick of Joseph, which is in Ephraim's hand, and of the Israelite tribes associated with him, and join it to Judah's stick making them a single stick of wood, and they will become one in my hand. Hold before their eyes the sticks you have written on, and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I will take the Israelites out of all the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. There will be one king over all of them, and they will never again be two nations or divided into two kingdoms. They will no longer defile themselves with their idols and vile images or with any of their offenses, for I will save them from all their sinful backsliding, and I will cleanse them. They will be my people, and I will be their God. My servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd, they will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. They will live in the land I gave to my servant Jacob, the land where your fathers lived. They and their children and their children's children will live there forever. 
and David my servant will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers, and I will put my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Then the nations will know that I, the Lord, make Israel holy, when my sanctuary is among them forever. This is the word of our Lord. So as we look at this picture that Ezekiel paints, or the Lord paints through Ezekiel, it's couched in Old Testament imagery, which is something that we're maybe not quite as familiar with, so it helps us to maybe look at that a little bit closer. Because when we look back in the Old Testament, we see that God's grace is, is showered all over it. By God's grace, according to his wisdom, he gave Abraham the promise that he would make him into a, a great nation. In fact, we read in Genesis 22, he said to Abraham, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. And even though at this time Abraham only had one child, God, God kept his promise. The descendants of Abraham became the nation of Israel. And God in his grace blessed them. He made them into a great, huge nation. He delivered them out of their slavery in Egypt. He guided them through the wilderness for years. And finally, he brought them into the land that he had promised to Abraham and to Jacob so that they could live there and be prosperous. But even though God showered his blessings on his Old Testament people, there were problems. <coughs> Like everyone else who's ever been born into this world, they came into this world with a sinful nature. And, and now there were times when things were going pretty well. Under King David, under King Solomon, the borders were expanded, the, the people lived in relative prosperity. But at the same time, there were also times when there were troubles. Over and over again, the people fell into the same old sins. Over and over again, there was backsliding and idolatry that ran rampant in the kingdom. And in fact, that's part of what Ezekiel is referring to in his scripture reading for this morning. After the reign of King Solomon, there was a great big problem. Selfish ambition, hurt feelings, that caused the nations to be Torn in two. And so there was the northern kingdom, which we sometimes refer to as the kingdom of Israel. And, and in our scripture reading for this morning, that's referred to as Joseph and Ephraim's kingdoms. And then there was also the southern kingdom. And that's one that's referred to in our scripture reading for this morning as Judah. And in the southern kingdom, that's where Jerusalem was, and that's where the temple was, where they worshipped God. And, and this separation that sin had brought was a big deal, because it lasted for a couple hundred years. And there were hurt feelings, there was fighting, there were all sorts of trouble that came from it. And, and the separation was a, a great big contributing factor to the sin that characterized the northern kingdom of Israel, the sin of idolatry. Because the first king in Israel, Jeroboam, the first one in the northern kingdom, while well, he didn't want his people's allegiance to be tested by having them go all the way to the southern kingdom, to Judah, to go and worship God, and so instead he put up idols for the people to follow. We read in 1 Kings after seeking advice, the king made two golden calves, and he said to the people, It's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. And this king became a sin. And throughout the next couple hundred years, throughout the next 20 kings of Israel, that sin just kept going on and on. Over and over again, the people slid back into that same old idolatry. And if you read through the book of First and Second Kings, there's one refrain that you will hear over and over again about each of those kings in the northern kingdom. 
He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and he did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. In the northern kingdom, idolatry ran rampant. But in the southern kingdom, things weren't a whole lot better. Yeah, there were times when there were good kings who, who tried to lead the people back to worshiping the true Lord. And, and through all of this, there were always a remnant. There were always some who remained faithful to the Lord. But even in the southern kingdom of Judah, idolatry ran rampant, and the people continued to wallow back and forth between worshiping the true God, the one who had truly delivered them, and these idols, which continued to lead them astray. And, and even in the southern kingdom of Judah, it got worse and worse until finally, during the time of Jeremiah, the Lord prophesied through Jeremiah, the people of Judah have done evil in my eyes, declares the Lord. They have set up their detestable idols in the house that bears my name and have defiled it. And that separation that sin had brought into the world, that in and of itself was bad enough, but the worst part of it was how the people's sin separated them from their God. And over and over again, the Lord warned them. Over and over again, the Lord sent his prophets to, to tell the people to turn away from their idolatry and, and turn back to the one true God. And, and by the time of Ezekiel, God had done just like he had prophesied. He said he was going to discipline his people if they didn't repent and turn back. And by the time of Ezekiel, the northern kingdom, they had already been conquered. Most of them had already been deported. And it seemed like the same thing was coming for the southern kingdom of Judah. In fact, some of those in Judah had already been captured and deported. And Ezekiel was one of those who was living away from his homeland. But it, it kept getting worse and worse until finally God's judgment came. And in 586, Jerusalem was totally destroyed and the temple was gone. And when that temple was destroyed, that's when the people really felt how their sin had separated from their God. Because this was the way that God had prescribed for them to worship Him. And now they simply could not worship according to the laws of the Old Testament because the temple was gone. Their sin had caused separation not only between them and their brothers, their, their fellow Israelites, their sin had brought separation between them and their God. Now, even though we might not have experienced the same separation or discipline as these Old Testament Israelites did, we can see that sin still does the same thing today. Sin still brings separation, still, sin still brings trouble and heartache. I mean, how often has selfish ambition or hurt feelings cause arguments between nations, even war? How often has sin caused separation where it doesn't need to be, even in the midst of families? But worst of all, just like it did for the Old Testament Israelites, our sins separate us from our God. They put this barrier between us and Isaiah writes, But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Because of our natural rebellion, we don't deserve to stand in God's presence at all. And then on top of this, we can also see how sin brings separation because death is in this world because sin is in this world. It's sin. That's the reason that we have to say goodbye to our loved ones when our Lord decides our time in this world is over. Paul writes in Romans, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sin. And without God's promises, that death would still be this, this fearful thing. 
But that's why the message of our scripture reading for this morning is, is so comforting, so important to us. Now, since it's couched in those Old Testament pictures, we may wonder, well, how in the world does what happened way back when, what Ezekiel prophesied, apply to us today? <coughs> I mean, what, what difference does it make for us? Well, the picture that Ezekiel paints is, is a picture of what happens by God's grace to God's kingdom spiritually. Because, you see, what Ezekiel prophesied never actually physically happened. Yeah, there was a remnant in Judah who, who was returned to the land of Israel, but the ten northern tribes, that northern kingdom, they're often referred to as the lost ten tribes of Israel because they, they never returned. This isn't just a picture of a, a physical thing that happened, but this is a picture of how God unites his kingdom spiritually. And with that in mind, we see the David that Ezekiel refers to in our scripture reading for this morning isn't the literal David come back to life, but it's David's descendant, our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came as a king who would rule forever, and he came so that he could fix the separation that sin had caused in this world. And that means when Jesus came into this world, he was perfectly united with his heavenly Father as well. Like every one of us, he was tempted to, to turn away from it, but no matter what, he kept his eyes focused on the prize. He was perfectly united with his heavenly Father, and that's why he could say to his disciples, I and the Father are one. Even when he was confronted by the temptations of the devil, Jesus never did anything that would separate him from his Heavenly Father or his Heavenly Father's will. And yet, when the time was right, Jesus was separated for us. When Jesus went to suffer and die on the cross, he endured the separation of hell itself. And that's why while Jesus was hanging on the cross, he, he cried out those incredible words. He said, the Lord, 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 which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was separated from God so that we wouldn't have to be separated. And because he endured that separation for us now, we get to be a part of God's family. We get to be joined once again, not only to Christ, but to all of Christ's family, to all those believers who put their trust and confidence in him. Paul also writes, For Christ himself is our peace, who has made the two one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. And because God has taken down that, that separation, because Jesus has solved the problem that sin has caused, we're reunited with all the believers of all time from all over the world. We're all a part of one family. We're all a part of one body. We're all a part of one church which is Christ's kingdom. And this picture of God reuniting all believers from all over the place gives us a great deal of comfort because that means that we're the spiritual Israel that's referred to in Ezekiel. Paul also writes, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as a chief cornerstone. And because we have been reunited with God and with his kingdom in this way, we can look forward to that day when we're going to be standing before his throne. We can look forward to that day because we know that we're going to be reunited with all those believers who have gone before us, who are the saints triumphant, who are already rejoicing in God's kingdom. And we can look forward because one day we too 
can leave sin and guilt and all that behind so that we can live in his presence forever with David our King, with Jesus Christ himself reigning over us. We will be in his presence. We will be with all those believers who have gone before us, those, those loved ones which we knew so well during their time in this world, and then we'll also be able to meet people like Moses and Elijah and Ezekiel and Daniel and whoever else. And we will be with the Lord forever. And therefore, may we find comfort in the fact that we have been reunited by the hand of the Lord. May we find comfort that we are united with all the believers past and present already today. And we will be able to see them face to face when our Lord calls us home. Amen. Now may this grace of God which surpasses all human understanding may it keep your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ our Lord. Jerusalem the golden With milk and honey blessed The sight of it refreshes The weary and oppressed I know not, oh I know not what joys await us there What radiancy of glory What bliss beyond compare They stand those halls of Zion All jubilant with song And bright with many an angel And all the martyr throng The princes ever in them The daylight is serene The pastures of the blessed Are ever rich and And there from care released The shout of them that triumph The song of them that feast And they who with their leader Have conquered in the fight Are clad in robes of white. Oh, sweet and blessed country, the home of God's elect. Oh, sweet and blessed country, that eager heart. Jesus in mercy bring us to that dear land of rest You are with God the Father and Spirit and